Hello guys, we're back with another election prediction video. This time we're going to be doing the 2022 Senate races as of the month of August. So right now, I would say that this Senate race, like overall, all these Senate races, they have shifted from a Republican wave, I would say, to now a neutral wave. It's more like just no party really has the biggest advantage in the Senate map, really, but the GOP does have an advantage in the House, which we'll be doing a video on that later. So, yeah, it's pretty interesting. Right now, it's going to be quite competitive in the Senate races. They're going to be very competitive, but in Iowa, I don't see that being that competitive because Chuck Grassley, he's a very long-serving incumbent, and Michael Franken really isn't that type of Democrat to get that wow appeal from a lot of voters, so I doubt he's going to win there. In Utah, you have Evan McMullen running here. I mean, in the polling, it does show it's getting a bit more competitive, but there's some polls out there that shows that the Republican nominee here has a lead of over 10 points. So I think overall, Utah's going to be voting for the Republican by over 10 points over the Independent. They're just going to associate McMullen with the Democratic Party, even though McMullen is fairly center-right. In Washington State, I highly doubt the Senate race is going to be that competitive. I think the Democrat here will win by over 10 points against Tiffany uh, Smiley, I think her name is, in the, for the Republicans here. She does have it within the 40s. Like, she does have good basis on board here, but nothing really here screams competitive to me, especially after Roe v. Wade ruling. It's definitely going to help Democrats in certain blue states like Washington and Colorado, which I also see going to the Democrat here by around eight to nine points against the moderate Republican they're running here. They're trying to emulate Glenn Youngkin here with the moderate Republican and good strategy, but I just think that in a lot of these blue states, energy has shifted back to Democrats, and Democrats are just outpacing Joe Biden in a lot of these states. In Missouri, we have a very interesting case here. So a third-party candidate is running here. He's center-right. Um... Uh, he gets around 10% in the polling, so I'm going to have to make this a likely state. Even with Greitens as the nominee, I think if it was just a two-way race, he'd probably win by over 10 points at this point, because I don't think voters really care that he resigned as governor of Missouri all, the, all those years ago. But uh, with an independent who's fairly right-wing running, he's going to split the vote a little bit, but I still think Missouri's a very Republican state. They'll still vote for the Republican by eight to nine points against the Democratic nominee, whoever that may be. Okay, the next states we're going to. Florida. At this point, you're looking at Rubio. He's building consistent leads in the polls. Some polls have him over 10%. And I'm just going to say this. I think Democrats should really not waste their time on Florida. I think it's going to be a safe GOP hold. Rubio's probably going to win by a margin of over 10%, I predict. I think he's going to do extremely well in the state of Florida. He's Latino. He'll have that support among Latinos. He'll probably win the Latino vote, honestly, as a Republican, which is hard to do in the state of Florida, but I think he'll probably do it. I think, no matter what, I think it's going to be a safe race for the GOP. Waste of time for Democrats to invest here. In North Carolina, you know, Ted Budd here is a fairly strong Republican candidate, and it's a neutral year, so I expect Republicans to win this by just about five points, almost to lean, but I don't think Cherry Beasley is going to be able to beat Ted Budd here. Now, in the state of Ohio, J.D. Vance is probably one of the worst Republican nominees I've ever seen in Ohio in quite a while. He is consistently underperforming in these pollings. You look at the fundraising matchups, and Tim Ryan's blowing them out of the water. It's nearly 10 to 1 in like fundraising dollars. J.D. Vance is an awful nominee. Republicans really should have went for Josh Mandel, who would have been a much safer bet, someone who's less radical for the state of Ohio. It's not a solid red state yet, but it's likely to lean red. However, I think even though Tim Ryan's leading the polling so far, I think Ohio polling, like it said it was going to be a close race between Trump and Biden. It should have polling lead to like Trump plus one or plus two, and it ended up being Trump plus eight. I'm going to assume, even though the polling suggests Tim Ryan's going to win by four points here, I think J.D. Vance is going to win by around three points or th four points against Tim Ryan, just assuming the polling's a bit off in the state of Ohio. Now, moving on from a state somewhere with bad polling errors, we're going to Wisconsin, which has pretty bad polling errors in favor of the Democrats here. I think Ron Johnson's going to hold on. He always usually held on, even though he's a bit radical. 
as a nominee for Republicans in the state of Wisconsin, I still think his incumbency advantage is going to come in for a break here and help him save him from uh, Mandela Barnes from beating him. And Mandela Barnes is fairly left. And in a state like Wisconsin, which is kind of a centrist state or a lot more populist, maybe if Mandela Barnes really leans into the populism, he could win here. But I'm going to be assuming Ron, oh, Ron Johnson holds on to his seat here in Wisconsin. Now the next state, New Hampshire. It's pretty much going to be a four to five point wing for Maggie Hassan here. I don't think she's going to lose to Don Bolduck at all. I don't see it as that competitive, and I don't think Republicans should waste time here because they don't have any good nominees for the state. All the good ones just declined to run, especially Chris Sununu, which could have made this a likely seat for Republicans. The state of Pennsylvania. John Fetterman's consistently leading in the polls by like eight to nine points. It's almost the time that it might go to likely, but I'm going to I'm going to assume the Republicans, usually in polling, they have a bit of it, like a three-point bump at times. So I'm going to assume by the time it, they'll get a bit of a three-point bump, like a three-point bump, somewhere along the line. So on average, I'd say he would probably win by three to four points. John Fetterman against Dr. Oz, who's just Dr. Oz is an extremely terrible nominee for the state of Pennsylvania. He's not even from there. He, he lived in New Jersey <laughs> for most of his time. Voters will see him as a carpetbagger. They also will question whether or not he has dual citizenship, too, with Turkey, and that'll be a serious question for voters in the state of Pennsylvania. And to add on, I don't think he has really good populist energy whatsoever. He really just screams elitist to a lot of voters here, and that's what's showing in the polling. John F. Fetterman's running an extremely good campaign. He just has to keep it up. Now, the state of Arizona, Mark Kelly is consistently leading any of the Republicans in polling so far, but I still think it'll be a two-point race in favor of Mark Kelly, but I do think he'll win the seat here. Now in Georgia, I expect this to be the one of the more competitive Senate races, and honestly, looking at the map, I think Georgia will probably dictate Senate control overall. I think it's going to come down to the wire here. Even though Herschel Walker is a terrible candidate, he'll still get some uh, help from Brian Kemp, who could help uh, get a lot of voters to vote both of them on the ticket, but I think there'll be a lot of ticket splitting in Georgia in the Senate race here. A lot of uh, independents will vote for Brian Kemp and for Raphael Warnock, just because of how extreme Walker is and how much of a damaging reputation he has with multiple personality disorder, these... Uh, abuse allegations from his former wives. I think that's definitely going to hurt him in the Georgia Senate race, especially when he proclaims himself as a family man, when he divorced that many times. And there's even stuff coming out that he has missing children that he just stopped caring for. So, yeah, he's a really bad nominee to run in the state of Georgia. Raphael Warnock could probably beat him by a narrow margin, under 1%. And in Nevada... Just currently with the Roe v. Wade ruling, I think it'll definitely give some wind in the sails of the Democrat here, Cortez Masto. I think she'll pull it off, but it'll be under 1% margin with Adam Laxall, who's a decently strong nominee for Republicans. Not the strongest, but better than most of the nominees they have in the swing states, that's for sure. So I think uh, the Democrats will probably pick up one seat, or it could just be a 50-50 tie. I mean, Nevada and Georgia, in my mind, are kind of coin well, Georgia, I would say it's 55% in favor of Warnock. Nevada, pure coin, tip, cost, coin toss, but I think it narrowly favors the Democrat here. So let me know what you think of this video in the comments below. Like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace out.